Let's get started. So today's tutorial is a really uh, fun project to work on. So you want your simulator to have a um, short turnaround time to run the synthesis. <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of work if you scroll down to the bottom. <clears throat> it won't be Arduino, right? upload the code, it's gonna work like snap. It takes five minutes for you. You have a 2021 version. I'm using a 2018 version. If you can, it's really fast. Um, my computer is not really. It's not the fast one. It's not even the workstation. It's i5, seventh generation, the Intel Core i5. Um, it works pretty good. Um, so let's take a look at the tutorial. So what you need to work on this project. Okay, so you have a lot of files to download, uh, but I put them in, in the one zip folder. You can download it here. Uh, you'll see the PowerPoint slides, but they put in the PDF. Shows the uh, registers available for KCPSM6. So most of the instructions are from this textbook. It's a very good one. I highly recommend you to buy it. Um, but we are not using all the, the rest of the book, uh, but only, you know, if you look at the black script here, <laughs> I've been using that chapters, the two chapters of that a lot. So it's Pico Place. Just look at the Pico Place, two chapters. So the Pico Place microcontroller is called KCPSM6. That's the newest version you can have. Uh, but I think the version being used over here in this textbook was KCP SM3. And you can find a picture similar to this one online for KCP SM3. Uh, it's very similar instruction guide, but there are minor changes. I don't have the time to pick up all the minor changes of the CPU structure. Uh, but if you, are, if you are looking at this one, you'll see that these are all these available uh, registers you can use. Now you'll get to know how to use it later pretty soon, actually. A bit. Mm -hmm. So you cannot, for example, directly in your assembly code, you just uh, directly use S12. You don't have it. I think SC probably is S12. So that's the name of the registers you can use to manipulate the data. Right, so that you can move the data over here and then uh, use a mask to end whatever. So these are just a temporary uh, storage units you can use for the assembly code. <clears throat> it has import, that's the input, and has output as right strobe, which is the enable of the right. And I have never used this one. Uh, you don't have to do anything to it for the tutorials and also the labs is directly made the connection of the key right strobe, key right strobe dot, you know, uh, it's gonna work. And port ID is important. So every port uh, has eight bits in there. It's a mux to select which port you wanna load the data from. So the port ID, you can see how many ports it has to the ace, right? 256 ports, it's a lot. And every port has eight bits. As you can imagine, the eight bit, eight bit, and until the 255, from, zero, from port zero to port uh, 255. And the, the ALU, remember we did ALU in uh, digital electronics, so if you haven't taken that class, which is fine. So, all these operations has to be uh, done. Uh, you, you know, you, you have to have that digital logic in the C, in the ALU in order to do that operation. Whenever, so you are not going to design the digital logic of the ALU because this is a upper level, um, not because it's advanced, right? Compared to the manually designed VLSI, probably this is easier. 
uh, but it's the upper level because it's not that that bottom. You don't have to do all the transistor by yourself and form the ALUs. Remember the ALU was very very simple. We didn't do uh, all the other instructions. We only had a uh, and or x or I think subtraction addition. That's it. But you can see this ALU has definitely more instructions, more functions. So which means they have to have that digital logic in there, the digital blocks to uh, implement these functions in there. But we don't have to design these things. We just need to know how to use these uh, instructions. And some of the decoding circuits, program counter. So the pro program counter is like a pointer you have learned in C++. It's pointing to different instructions in the program memory. So the program memory is a memory holds all the programs. So program whatever you want to do to the microcontrollers uh, to do some kind of uh, um, function or workflow in assembly. And the compiler is going to compile the assembly code into machine code, one and zeros, and store them in the program memory. So the pro program counter is counting, uh, is adding ones to the address of the program memory, so it's taking out specific instructions or you know programs from the bank. So what's the how many bits do we have for each row for the program memory? Address is twelve. So address twelve means how many rows do we have? Two to the twelfth, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, that many rows, so you can store that many programs or assembly lines in there. So assembly is different from C. Right? When you're programming the C or C++ in Arduinos, uh, you, you write one or two lines, it's been compiled. It's going to be like two, 10 to 12 lines probably. But assembly, usually it's one line, one line. It's um, very straightforward. Um, you can see that the address is 12 bit. So that's one of the differences between this and the KCP SM3. So when you are copying and pasting the code from this one, which is uh, what you are supposed to do actually, uh, you have to modify a lot. So one of the things you have to modify is the, the length of the address. You have to change the number from seven to 11. Okay. And the instruction, the uh, program memory, definitely these instructions are 8 bits, keep in mind. So all these registers are 8 bits. That's why all the data being processed by these things are 8 bits. Because it's an 8 bit microcontroller, like the 8 bit microcontroller you are using with Arduino. Okay, it's an 8 bit microcontroller, it's an 8 bit computer system. Your computer is 64 bit computer system, right? It's different. It's uh, very simple. It's the simplest you can you can find online, I guess. Um, and you don't need a powerful IPGA. You just use a basic board. You can implement the micro little micro controller on it, which is really awesome. So I think the rest of the, the like these snapshots or from this textbook. So some of them may be up, uh, outdated already. So let's take a look at the instructions. How many instructions do we have? It's a ten bit. See. So 10-bit instruction address. So now we have 12. Remember? I just want to clarify that. So the this is updated. This is KCP SM. Up to date, right? Only this figure. But all the rest of them are from the textbook. And these are for the KCP SM3. Let's keep in mind. Some of the numbers, most of them are the same. No difference. But some of the numbers are uh, not right. Okay, you're asking why I'm not using the, the new ones. Let's see how long the tutorial is. It's take me like a year to, it's like writing a new book. I hope so, actually. I'm trying to write a new book for uh, KCP SM6. What about that? Um, so when you are reading these ones, trying to be uh, critical. Don't trust all of them, uh, but most of them are, are correct. This is just showing you the structure, you know, that's a program counter. You can see it's counting. 
which one you want to take out from the instruction memory is actually the program memory stores all the assembly, you know, the uh, compiled assembly code, right? They already being converted into a machine code. So now I think why is this IPG class so uh, practical? Because you are working on the not uh, really very bottom down to the CMOS level, but it's it's really really low enough to let you see how these digital systems are are communicating with with each other, like VGAs. I mean, when I was little, I was thinking, you know, how these monitors are showing pictures, are even animations. I was looking like the NEC on the back of the monitor, and why it's showing animation. But now I understand it's assigning pixels very quickly, and have your frames, uh, and how that was communicated during this couple of states <laughs> in your Verilog. And how that works because Verilog was being synthesized into what into kind of analyst and analyst was being eventually implemented into the digital design which were uh, uh, you know formed by logic gates and what are logic gates CMOS transistors what are, what are CMOS transistors pn junctions and pnps down to the atom level so you know from the very top when you're programming algorithm you know what's happening in the CPU. <laughs> um, so that's a good measure, right? So when you're, if you have kids in the future, when they ask you questions, you know all the answers to these questions. <clears throat> Something you have to do if you wanna know how to program in assembly, okay? Read the instructions on this test in this textbook thoroughly and do not just run through it for once you have to come back to the to the aspect of the chapter that introduces all the instructions not too many i think only less than 50 i guess you have to know what they does okay i'm going to give you some examples and so the end instruction it's gonna do a or logic. You're not paying attention. You're not just <laughs> so and the end instruction is gonna end whatever stored in SX and SY. It's a bitwise end. See, it's a bitwise, so it's bit by bit and operation. And the result is being stored in SX. Keep in mind, not SY, SX. So why I can directly write SX here, not S S or S um, U S whatever. It has to be SX, keep in mind. Because these are the registers available here. Do I do I have SX? You don't. It's just an example. It's showing you like S1, S2, N2, S E or F, S F, right? Just example. Um, so what is C? It's a carry. It's a flag. Uh, there are, I think, two different types of flags. One is C carry. Another one is Z. It's just another a bit memory bank, a uh, memory, you know, storage somewhere else. It's indicating something just happened. So. When you are using C's and Z's, you'll find out you really have a lot more freedom to, you know, move things around. It's very useful. Uh, but you don't have, you cannot directly end a C to something or directly use it. It's just make, making a conditional uh, statement. Um, for example, C right now. So after, right after this end operation, so C is zero, right? Because there's no carry. So next to it, right after it, you can have a, a conditional statement. You can say jump to another instruction if C is zero. It's called jump NC, so not C, so C is zero. Jump NC, comma, to which sub function. So you don't have if, right? If is something in C or Python. So how do you do this conditional statement in here? You have to jump. How do you make a judgment for jumping or not? You have to convert your mind from C, you know, that's such a wonderful language to use. Now to something like you have to manipulate yourself. 
that I have to do the operations. So for example, on the check, if something is zero, you just end it. No, so for example, I wanna check one bit. I don't know if it's zero or one, right? I wanna check if that bit is zero or not. What I wanna do? I wanna, you wanna or one. I'm going to order that bit to a 1. So if it's a 0, I'm going to get 0, right? Something like that, like that. So you have to do some operation to, you know, try to get the result indirectly. That's why you need to practice on it. So you can, also end, you can also end a register with a constant. So like... Um, FA, right, AB, all these hex numbers, uh, you can do that. So they have to be A bits because this is an A bit CPU. Or you can do register level or, you can or a constant, doesn't matter. But I have to load something to the register first, otherwise there, there will be zeros um, by default, right? XOR, you know, similar, you can add, right? Add x y to uh, x x to s y, and assign results to s x. Eventually, you can add a constant to a register. So the register is still a memory holding a, a, a bit value. It's nothing else. Just a if you a bit if you array. You have more options here. So it's add a c y. So it's not just adding something. It's a full adder. It's also adding a carry. So the carry has to be generated by something else, like all the, like this one, right? These kind of things. After that, it's going to update C. You only have one C. You don't have multiple Cs. So only one C. Um, have to be careful because if you want to use C as something to make a judgment, it has to be right after the operation. Otherwise, it's going to be changed by other, like by the, by the different one, by this one, right? If you have some other instructions in the middle, it's going to change it later. So if you want to, since there, there's only one C, um, want to use it, use it immediately. Don't wait uh, for too, too late, okay, since it will be overwritten later on. Subtraction. Compare and test. So these are actually very, very useful. So these will give you the values you may need to make a conditional statement or make a judgment. So let's see what these instructions do. Compare S, X, S, Y. Just comparing these two. What's going to happen? See these two flags? Keep in mind, I only have one Z, one C. I'm going to use it, use it immediately, right? So if these two registers have the same value, then Z is 1. If they are not equal, z is zero. And also, they, you can compare which one is larger, which one is smaller, right? If s y is larger, then c is one. Otherwise, c is zero. So after after this instruction, for example, if they are equal, if they are equal, after this instruction, which flag you can use? Actually, both, right? So Z becomes what? If they are equal, Z becomes 1. C becomes... Yeah. I'm going to show you why they are useful. Let's see the jump. Jump, jump, jump. See here. Jump to AA, which is... Uh, a label of another sub function, like you jump to another sub function if C is one. Got it? That's how you make if statement happens in assembly. If non C, not what? Huh? I guess C is not one. Yeah, not one. So C is zero, right? If C is zero, then jump. If C is one, jump. See? 
Same for Z. Z, non-Z. Make jumps. Very useful. Uh, let's take a look at No, it's jump to functions. So you label the function. So before you write a block of assembly, let me show you. Here. So the name of the function is loop. Keep in mind, the loop is just name. It's not necessary to be a loop. You have to jump it here, make it loop. <laughs> um, so the function you write in Arduino is uh, jumping back and forth if you put them in the loop function, right? It's going to run it back and forth automatically. However, in assembly here, it's not doing that. You have to tell the compiler to do it. So it's doing this, this, and jump to loop. So come back and then keep doing that. It's a loop. Uh, <clears throat> See more functions. Again, so this lecture just give you a very simple introdu introduction. Uh, read this book and always use it when you are programming assembly. Since you have to look at the all the C's, all the labels, all the things. You know, even I, I'm also reading this book when I'm coding the assembly over here. And when you are programming a different CPU, it has a different instruction set, right? It's using different uh, strategies to jump. Uh, oh, usually they are similar. For example, if you're using uh, MIPS, uh, these uh, architectures, they also have load. They also have store. Um, they have add and or, very similar, but they will have also a lot of differences in instructions. So you have to have a menu uh, to be with you when you're programming. Let's see some other ones. Shift is also very important. So the shift ones are all different types of shifting. So SL is shifting to the left, as R is shifting to the right. And you can see SL0, that's a zero type uh, shifting left and zero type shifting right. What this does, there is an 8-bit data. If you put it in the register, like S1 or something, and if you, shift, if you shift it, if you do this, right, SL0 and that register, what's going to happen? Let's take a look at it. SL, I think SL is here. It's SL0, it has to be followed by that register. So what this does is it shifts all the data to the left by one bit and fill a zero to the LSB. and shifting the MSB to C. So you can use this function to do a lot of things. For example, you want to know what's a, what, what is MSB there. Okay. If you don't do this, if you don't do left shifting, what else you can do? I want to know if the MSB is one or zero. What else I can do? I'm just writing a four-bit value number here, okay? I would like to know if this is one or zero. You're asking like, you can tell it's one. <laughs> the computer does <laughs> cannot tell. Your brain can can um, precise two D pictures. Computer is the you know is one D just all all the arrays. <laughs> So yes, you can shift this to the left, right? And this one will, will be stored in C. And I can say jump C. If it's one, I, I'm going to jump to like loop. It's just the name of the function. And I have a sub function here, right? Called a loop. So it's doing something, right? Colon, that's a colon. And doing something here. What is an alternative to it? Mask. 
hold on mask. How can I check this zero? If I or this guy with F. If I or this guy with F, no, it won't work. If I and uh, or this guy with this, if I or this one with E, right? This is E. What's gonna happen? All the other bits here, here, here will become what? Wait. I or this data, I want to check if what is I must be here. If I or it with E, whatever these bits are, it becomes one as a result, right? What about this one? What about MSB? MSB. If this bit is one, I'm getting a one. If this bit is zero, I'm getting a zero. So in that case, whatever this one, this result is, I can check if this, if this, um, is there an instruction to check if this is zero, non zero? Hmm. Yeah, there must be a way to use a mask to, fi to figure that out. Mm -mm, yeah, you can compare, definitely. You can compare this one in the register and do a compare. I prefer this one. I prefer the left shift. That's why I'm telling you the left shift is so sweet. You want to use that one. <laughs> so you can compare this one with another one. If the equals and Z, C, whatever, right? You can make a judgment over there, okay? Yep. And the, all these ones are doing a similar thing. So what about ICL1? SL1 is going to plug a 1 to the LSB. SLX, what is this? I've never used that one. But if you need it, uh, you can check the details of it. Let's see, SLX, what is this one doing? it keeps the LSB. So it didn't drop the LSB. So LSB is still there. I shift all the lower seven bits to the left up by one bit and it duplicates LSB to the LSB bit again, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm, the MSB bit uh, went to C later on. Okay. Load, <laughs> very common. So it's loading in a specific direction. It's loading from SY to SX, keep in mind, from right to left, as always. For a store, it's from left to right. Keep in mind, in assembly is very common. Uh, if you're taking computer architecture, you'll see. Uh, for load, it's always from, from right to left. For store, it's always from uh, left to right, right? different directions. For fetch, it's from right to left. So what's the difference? Fetch and load. So load is just a simply load. It's being used in all places, right? It's loading whatever in this register to here, is loading a constant to here, directly putting that A-bit data here to the register to store the data in there as load. Very simple, straightforward. For fetch, it has to be 
uh, interaction between the register and the memory. So over here, it has to be a memory. See RAM? And whatever inside the parentheses is the address of the memory. So it's not the register, not the data anymore. So parentheses, whenever you see a parentheses in assembly, it indicates an address. It's like a pointer, right? So inside is address, and overall is the data. So it's taking, it's taking the address being stored at the address of SY and take it out and store in SX. That's how that works. See RAM is random access memory. Okay. Store is the opposite direction of the fetch. Storing SX, whatever in SX, to address of SY, right? In the memory. Input, so keep in mind, this is how you can interface with uh, ports. Here's a port ID. If you have a zero, zero, you, how many ports do you have? Keep in mind, remember, you have to remember that. We'll talk about it at the very beginning. How many ports? Let's take a look at it. The 12 is the number of bits for the memory address. So two to the 12s for a two to the 12s rows for the memory, instruction memory. So for the ports, 255, 256, including zero, right? So zero to 255. <clears throat> that many ports, how many bits for each port? Eight, so these are all eight data, okay? Eight bit data. Output, same are similar, you want to connect the data here to some port. So it's F00 to FF. Okay, 0, 0, 0, 001, 0, 02 until FF. So there are the jumps, which is uh, mentioned it. Very useful, you'll use this a lot. So this explains call function, the call function, and the return function. So the call function is very similar to jump, uh, but it's directly calling. You don't have to have a condition there. It's call it, it's gonna call it. You don't have to like make a judgment of Z, C, it's call it. And for return, it returns to, so for example here, I call this subroutine, right, I call it. It won't execute the next one immediately. It's gonna run this one first and put all the other ones in the stack and then come back to do the rest. So a call the routine comes to here and run it. It's going to return to here. So do you think it's going to return to call or return to sub? Yes. What if it returns to call? It's a dot loop. <laughs> so return to sub and keep moving on. Okay. But there, you can add a condition to call. So it becomes very similar to jump. Non Z, Z, non Z, C, non -Z, uh, NC, return. You know, you can even add a condition for return. Only C is one, it returns. Only C zero, it returns. And you can program a really fancy program just using assembly. You won't enjoy it. <laughs> it's gonna work eventually, but keep in mind, only eventually. <laughs> Who knows how long it's gonna be. Um, so these instructions are very similar, uh, even though these are the ones in KCP SM3, but I've never seen any big issues using instructions, but only these instantiations. You, when you're instantiated, you have to change the length of the address and all these little things. Um, and I think that's it. And these are some, um, I mean, how can I use these ones? You have to claim it at the very beginning. So uh, these ones, keep in mind, when you are naming your register, 
for naming your function, don't use address, don't use name rack. So these are the reserved. Um, so at the very beginning, you can claim, um, for example, name rack. Okay, I name this register as index. So in the future, I don't have to use S5 because it's not really readable uh, for the function. If you put index, people knows, okay, so whatever store in here is an index. So it's probably doing like I equals something, when I is less than something, I plus plus one, right? So it's an index. Or you can name it a different way if you have a different function to be assigned to the rack. So you can use this one, this directive to uh, rename it. And same here, constant max is F0. So later on, if I'm using, if I'm calling max, it's gonna be F0 later, okay? Like these ones, see? These are being used a lot actually for the in the examples. So constant. So after that, you can still use zero tool, but you don't have to because this variable is gonna hold zero tool in it. It's constant. It's a constant variable, no. <laughs> it's a constant. What is this one doing? Or, right? It's or logic. It's oring S0, whatever stored in S0 is a register, keep in mind. It's oring whatever is stored in S0 with what? Zero tool. So what is zero tool? This one is a hex number, right? So all these numbers here, you don't have to, to, to write a zero x, zero two in here, like what, it, what you did in, in C++. Uh, it's uh, by default, it's a hex number. So zero two is zero 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 one zero. So test, let's look at test. What is test doing here? Test is another function you can use or an instruction you can use. Kind of uh, very handy. So test these two, the values in these two registers, it's actually doing an end logic, do an end logic and assign it to T. And if T is zero, then Z becomes one. If T is one, then Z is zero. So we have Z here as a flag to be used. So what kind of application you can think of, of this instruction? So what is this one doing actually? You can use it to test if one of these registers is zero, just pure zero, right? If one of them is zero, after the end logic, the result must be zero. So Z becomes one, so which means Z like zero, right? So when Z is zero, Z becomes one. <laughs> when T is zero, Z becomes one, not Z. So Z flag will be one if one of them is zero. So you can test if one of them is, is zero. Uh, so whenever you, you know the other one is not zero, it's gonna be useful because if the other one definitely is not zero and if you are doing n logic and the result is zero, which means Sx must be zero, right? So you can use that one to test if it's zero. So you can use it as a counter in the counter, right? Counting down. You want to run the loop for five times, and every time you get in the loop, you you subtract the count by one and until it becomes zero. How do how do you know? You use test, right? Use test. If it if it is zero, then z becomes one. So you can do a jump z to somewhere. So when z is one, which means it's a zero, the count becomes zero. Then jump to somewhere. So you're done with the five loops. All right, let's look at the example uh, script over here. So what this one does, first end uh, S0 
who is this guy? What's going to happen? So here's a mask. S0 is a register. It has a bit um, value there. So I have zero, four zeros, four ones, and something. What's going to happen? The upper four bits will be cleared. So whatever here will be cleared to zero. Whatever here will be not changed, unchanged. So what's happening here? And test as zero. So after the analogic, where is the result being stored at? As zero. So as zero will store the final result. Why do we want to do that sometimes? You want to take, you want to extract the lower four bits because that carries some kind of information. Is there a different way to do it? Maybe, yeah. You can sh keep shifting all the bits to the left so all the upper bits will be out and you have the lower four bits being stored as the upper four bits and then shift it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but if you are using a mask just directly and it done and then the result is being stored here in here and the test is doing what analogic remember it's, it's, an, it's doing analogic it's ending this one to this one so what is what is in here this and What's happening? It's all zeros, right? We all zeros. You had you had the lower bits, whatever the lower four bits here, and now you end to these four zeros. It's going to be zeros. And because you cleared the upper four bits to zeros here. And now you end to this mask, it's still gonna clear out all those four bits. So we're getting all zeros, right? If it's non-zero jump to here, this label, MSP set, right? If it's zero, done. <clears throat> sure, is there a chance to jump to here? What's it? Why you will have a chance to Get this subroutine executed. As zero, but it's been cleaned, right? I don't think so, too. Just found a bug in the book. Right? It's all cleared, nothing. There must be something in between, but based on these ones, So now let's see how this works. The workflow for for uh, getting these things work uh, definitely it's not that straightforward because it's not a commercial uh, microcontroller can use. If this one is being sold, I I bet no one is gonna buy it. So you have to program your assembly in, in any text editor. I use uh, GVM. I'm gonna ask you to use it as well. So just open up the GVM and start coding in, in there. Um, there's nothing different uh, for initiating a project, okay? Still in the same MPGA, same settings, no difference. However, you, uh, you, you download the package on the top of the page, right? So you're going to have some of these things. So the KCPSM6.exe is a compiler. You have to place it 
in it doesn't have to be in the in the IPG project over here. Okay, it can be an empty folder in Windows, and you put this one in the folder, and what else I have to put in there? See, KCPSM6.v. That's a CPU. That's a whole CPU. It's just a module, Varlog module. You just need to instantiate it in your top module to use it. So you need that one, definitely. You need a template, design template. You can click, get into it, and see the examples. But this is not required to uh, compile your assembly. Neither this one. So these are Varlog code, not for compiling. However, you need a ROM underscore form dot V for the comp for the comp uh, comp compiler. What this one does is the ROM is a read-only memory. It stores all the instructions. You you code it in assembly, but you need a form. So this ROM underscore form is gonna uh, work with the compiler, which is this guy, to convert your uh, instructions in assembly into a uh, Verilog version that you can directly instantiate in your top. You know what I mean? So how do you make the connections? You are coding assembly. Okay, you're done. What's next? Compile it. You want to compile it into a one zeros and store them in the ROM. But you need a ROM.v. How to make that ROM V? You have to keep that ROM underscore form V in the same folder when you are compiling that assembly. So where is the compiler? Which one is the compiler? Again, which one is the compiler? Here. That's a compiler. I have to keep this one and this one at least. The compiler and the ROM form V in the same folder and also your assembly code in the same folder. So the assembly code has a different extension. Let me see. Let me show you. Uh, so the PSM, you start a GVIN file and name, rename extension. If you don't have the option, just go to the folder options in Windows to, to show the extensions. So you can modify the extensions. So generate a text file in the command line. Just follow this step. You know, before I do that, you need to follow another one. Um, yeah, I didn't show you that because I've done this for the whole semester. So just generate the GVIN file and change the, change the extension to PSM. That's assembly code. Is that clear? And code it up in GVIM. You can code it up in GVIM with a .PSM extension. It's a text editor. Code it up, save it, close it, and put it in the same folder as uh, which one? ROM underscore form dot V. So it's going to, uh, and then in your command line, you know, CD into that directory, the folder holds that assembly code file and also the ROM dot underscore form dot V file. You need these two at least, okay? and run that kcpsm6.exe, which is the compiler, space, the program, whatever you want to name it, doesn't matter. So that's assembly. And press enter. It's going to run. It's going to compile the assembly code. And there will be a window pops up for two seconds and show you errors or no, no errors. If there are errors, the window will stay there for Forever, you, uh, before you close it. There are no errors, it's gonna pop up for two seconds and close itself by itself. So you're done. And after that process, it's gonna show that <coughs> dot V file that it can directly instantiate in your top module. So the assembly instructions are being compiled into one zeros. However, you cannot directly use one zeros, you need a ROM file, which is a Verilog module. Uh, to be used as a ROM in your top. That's why we are doing that, compiling. So compile it, it becomes a ROM file, dot V. 
So now you can directly use it. To look at the name module and instantiate in the top, it's gonna work. So what else do you need to instantiate in the top? What else? A CPU. You got a CPU, you got a memory. Done. That's the simplest version of the CPU. You got a CPU, which is a key CPS M6. Just instantiate, how to instantiate that CPU. Just call the name of it, right? KCPSM6. UUT, if you want to name it as UUT, doesn't matter. And then the ROM. UUT2, whatever, and make the connections and have a little uh, clogged bear log. So import is being shorted to switch. So now you have your input for the CPU, which, which are switches. So you cannot change the name of it here. If you change it here, you have to change it here. So the import is the name of the import in the CPU. And this import is the import in the top. You can name it whatever you want. But don't change it. It's just making troubles. So here is a... Uh, so the CPU is working on, you know, whenever something is being written, uh, it's uh, asserting this bit, writing stroke, which means something is being written. And whenever that happens, you assign output, which is also a name of, of the output in the CPU. If you look at the KCPSM3, it has the output, the import output, input output, okay? So the output should be assigned to the LEDs. So that whatever the output receives, will be directly assigned to LEDs. So it's gonna show the result um, to the LEDs. So the first example you can try, it's very simple, which is you you, you turn on the switch, it's gonna turn on that specific uh, LED on the top of it. Yeah. You can get it done very quickly in our log, but now we are doing a, using a CPU to do, to do it. Turn on the switch, it's gonna turn on that LED on the top. So that's the first one you're going to do, okay, to practice. I'm going to demonstrate you the oh, Pico Plus microcontroller being implemented on Cringe. the RX7 uh, IPGA. And so, uh, also the let's see. assembly code for the bits of the switch, plus zero squares getting one, and one square plus one square is getting two. Oh. And so one I, square, I changed uh, that a little bit. So what five. I'm doing here is and one square plus um, four square is getting uh, seven. I think. And if I have uh, two square plus, um, is that two square? Two square as well. So uh, it should be eight. It uses the same function as the top module. And should be. Um, uh, four square plus two square, which is twenty, and it's showing twenty here. Oh, it's the right squares. I think I have an easier example for you guys. It's here. Switch control, turn on it. Yeah, so every switch controls the LED. Switch. So boring. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Definitely try that one. And the square problem, right? Just calculating the square function. Uh, read it, read the test book to understand it. And keep in mind, uh, so the textbook provides all the all the scripts how to how to claim the ports, uh, and you need to make corresponding changes. Keep in mind, for example, uh, this is example from the textbook, and I use it. There are many things that are missing, uh, like this one. So you are asking, like, where did you find these ports? All the statements. It's in the template. Remember. So the developer, when they developed that CPU, definitely that person is not expecting everyone can can know what, what they should add to the to the code. You know, they have to learn first. So that's a template file. It's in the folder. Uh, it's this one. You cannot directly synthesize it because it's being commented out. It's just providing all the examples in different blocks. So you want to open it up and 
Sometimes you need to co copy and paste. Sometimes you have to change some numbers. But I uh, provided all the solutions to the simple examples. Just you just need to follow and repeat before you can be creative. Okay, so learn it first. Take the baby steps. So do the LED problem. Do the square problem. And definitely want to replace this declarations and then I gave you several different tasks uh, making nonsense no no applications at all just uh, manipulating these registers to practice very small programs and small tasks like these ones so that's why I'm asking you to have a fat, uh, shorter turnaround time so you can test, you can really enjoy that. Not really enjoy, but <laughs> at least not torturing you, right? It's getting better. Um, so try 2018 if your version is too slow. So when you are programming these ones or debugging these ones, uh, what I did is actually I have my Vivado always open and I have the command window always open. And you know that if you push the arrow key on the keyboard it, it is able to roll these instructions you just use right so you don't have to keep typing that kcpsm6.exe to execute to compile something it's, and you don't have to change the file name of the you, you keep debugging this assembly so you are not changing the name of the file right so just push the arrow up going up it's going to call the previous uh, command and you press enter it's going to recompile it uh, if no error, great. Um, if errors, then you have to, you know, try to fix the syntax error. And if no errors doesn't mean that it's going to work, right? It may have issues with, uh, with the code. So this process will reduce the time, amount of time for you to compile the assembly. That one takes only two seconds for me. You, you use the Alt tab to keep changing the windows from the command line and the Vivado, and you change it back to command line, you, you press the arrow, up arrow, and close that command, push enter, recompile it. You get that uh, program V file updated, and then shift to Vivado, run the synthesis, and get some snacks, come back, <laughs> and see the results, right? So all the little practice, you know, trying to manipulate the jumps, test, load, return. I have to have a return, okay? Otherwise, it's not running the loops for you. Um, some very simple tasks in tutorial, so you'll be ready for the lab. So I'm gonna, you know, update some, some of the information for the lab and plan for the rest of the semester. So if you look at the calendar for the for the course, we have this soft core, some of the examples on the, in the tutorial, and then we are going to work on the USB. Uh, definitely not the, the bottom part of the USB is super complicated. So it has so the basic three board has a PIC microcontroller, which is from microchip, uh, the same vendor for Arduino chips. So they make really good microcontrollers and that microcontroller can convert whatever protocol from serial to USB, USB to serial, so it, it is able to handle that for you. Um, so you don't have to, you know, figure out the logic for USB. So what we have here is uh, USB control and send the signal to a serial monitor or to the board. Okay. I think it's a one week work. It's not very complicated. And then, since this class covers all the seven outcomes for ABAT, um, what are the seven outcomes? Let's take a look at it. We are going to be ABAT accredited by August. That's the earliest eligibility for us. We have to have uh, graduates first, then apply for ABAT accreditation. So for some of you guys are applying for jobs, 
uh, they may require that, but just let them know we already applied and we got a really good review. Um, hopefully in August we'll get will be accredited. Okay, if that is, is required, I will give you one example. One of the graduates this semester, uh, he found a job and they really want to hire him. Uh, so, but they require that accreditation to give him an engineer engineer engineering title. Uh, but however, they have to wait until August to give him the, that title. So they have to be, so he has to be a scientist at our beginning for two months. No, no difference on salary, but sounds better. I don't know, <laughs> engineer, scientist, more hands-on engineer. Uh, so look at these ABAT out outcomes. One through seven. One, problem solving. You don't have to read it. It's overwhelming. Uh, I'm just telling you the, the summaries. One, problem solving. I give you an equation you can solve it. Very basic. Two, design. Okay, You know how to solve the problem, but also design something new. Three, communication. Overall, uh, written, you know, you have to write reports. We are writing reports, even though these reports are <laughs> with typos. Uh, oral communication, presentation, it's final presentation for the project. Okay, you need to stand here to present. Ethical, I'm going to show you what we have. I don't want to spend two weeks on ethical problems. Uh, you're taking professional ethics, it's required. So that one will take care of it, the curriculum. And team, to work effectively on the team. So you have two people on one team for the final project for, the, for this course. Six is experimentation. You are doing experimentation pretty much every day. So no problem. New knowledge, which means I give you, assign you something that I don't directly give you the solution or tutorial. I have to search for literature study, you know, any uh, materials to find an answer to it new knowledge, generating new knowledge, or have a new design, uh, which other people have never done before. Um, we're not requiring you to have the same level as what the senior, senior SAM students are doing here, but we are definitely generating new things. Uh, let's look at the project. Two different projects, Pong game or uh, Yoshi's Nightmare Game. You have to use the basic storyboard to program it. So it's sending that video signal through VGA. And you can, you can do either one, but have to, you, you cannot switch in between these two projects. You have to let me know by a date, like you want to do which one, and stick to it, OK? Um, what are these two projects? It's unrealistic to let you guys, you know, start from scratch. So the first pong game, uh, you know, was done by a person, you know, on, who uploaded code online. Don't freak out when you look at when you watch the video. See, like this is a course project for EE one twenty five. We are doing CE four thirty three. <laughs> Don't freak out. I mean, this guy, he, if he generates everything from scratch. It's going to be a personal engineer in Google or somewhere. I mean, uh, uh, or he might use the other people's code to modify it, whatever. Um, this is not definitely not a 100 level project. <laughs> I can tell you, I, I, I was a TA in ULV, which has a, a PhD program. I, I taught even 100 and 200 level digital design over there. I've never seen a person getting anything, any product like that, even close. It's usually just a little calculator using the switches. That's a course project, but not, not this. Um, but I want to really generate something really fun. And uh, hopefully, we can have a monitor uh, mount to the wall uh, in, in the L, in the third family hall, or the first floor, second floor, doesn't matter. A monitor have a uh, can be push button controlled. Uh, I just put a basic storyboard over there to have the visitors to play around with the game in the future. That's what I'm you know, visioning. Um, so the code for the pawn game was in VHDL. So here's the new knowledge. I never taught VHDL for you. 
<laughs> so you need to you need to you don't so the requirement is lower. You don't have to be able to code in VHDL uh, proficiently in here. So you just need to be able to read it. Uh, it's very easy. So the uh, the main blocks are exactly the same, but just the syntax is different. Very the workflow, all the strategies, everything's the same, no difference. So you have to read their VHDL code and convert it into Verilog. Uh, I have his original code in VHDL, and I directly downloaded it to my uh, Vivado project. I synthesized it, implemented it, and generated the uh, VStream. It worked really well. I can, uh, you know, play it, actually. Uh, so if you are picking up this project, you need to convert it into Verilog and understand it and explain it during the presentation. And also change the logos to FLC logos. You have to look into look into that. How do you generate that bitmap? Um, convert a picture into pixels and uh, convert into one zeros in the memory. So it's going to be a FLC something, right? But definitely want to give credit to this guy. Don't forget that in your project or in your demo demonstration. The second one is written in Verilog. However, uh, it has very thorough instructions. You can look at the uh, references. It has original code, has an instruction tutorial on it. But it's using a game console, and I don't have it. So if you are working on this project, first you need a you need to add a starting picture, a starting page. Doesn't like this one. It just got started. You need a starting page like this one, and with F FLC logo on it, and give credit to the original author, and change the control to push buttons or joysticks. Since some of you haven't taken robotics tool, if you have taken robotics tool, you can consider using a joystick. It's gonna be even better, actually. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Or use push buttons to control. It's just like moving this little duck or dinosaur, I don't know, just move it around to avoid the falling rocks or something, I don't know. Um, I compiled it uh, and worked, but I don't have a control. Uh, so that's why I don't know if I can really play the game, uh, but you will be able to. So that's a course project and you wanna refer to the timeline to it. And we have a Pico Blaze lab as well. Well, it's adding a lot of work to the rest of the semester. So what you have here, I'm not making this very difficult. There's a demonstration, three tasks. The first one, just copy and paste. I'll modify the declarations, the name of the ports, these things to make it compatible with uh, KCP SM6. Uh, it's a, you'll read the, you, you'll watch the video here, it's explain everything. And then I ask you to show the results on the LEDs instead of some segment display should be a very simple change. And um, the last one can be a little bit challenging. Show the hex number on LCD display. Okay, so you can com combine these two labs together into one. So considering the third one is a little bit challenging, I am making this one a two-week lab. But I have to finish task one, two, by the first week. I think that's what I did here. See, due Wednesday, next week. And task three is due Wednesday, the week after next week. And if you can finish all these tasks earlier, you can start working on the course project as soon as possible. So you can see the time for the presentation, which is the last day of the uh, term for this class. Um, so we are using the live time. So Thursday and from 8 to 11 a.m. Oh, what about the second section? We probably don't need three hours, we just need one hour, five teams. So I'm going to change it later. I just use uh, 11, 15 to 12, 30, uh, 40 here. All right. The report, you need a report because this serves the uh, uh, a bat number what outcome? Three communication. That's so a writing. So 
So I'll pick up typos in there if you have any. So because this is going to be some, I'll take some student student samples, student samples. So it's okay to have some, you know, typos, since I will show them like example, like see I'm grading very <laughs> the detail, but showing take one point so we have a typo. It's kidding. Just try to make a better report if you can. All right. I think that's everything for the semester. We still have six weeks. Shy, a little bit shy for six weeks. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Five. What you think? Good. So Essex examples. There's a quiz on it. So 25. You don't have to memorize anything. So that's everything you need to read. And uh, the quizzes will be, I'll give you an example, it's very simple. Is it sufficient that engineers in the fulfillment of their professional duties carefully consider the safety, health, and welfare of the public? True or false? Carefully consider? Is that good enough? You should consider it all the time. <laughs> so it's false. <laughs> Seems like that. Easy. Let's see the answers. Let's see the, check the answers for the first one. Oh. IL1. So it's here. I. Is that the first one? Oh, called oh, Paramount. <laughs> so it should be the first consideration, not just carefully. Yeah, easy, right? Just need to spend about uh, 30 minutes to read it and check the answers frequently okay. to know the tricks. It's sometimes useful actually, for example, uh, should you always be optimistic as an engineer? This actually teaches me. So I'm having, I'm working on the high, high voltage per, uh, contract with a company right now. I'm still working on it, trying to solder the, the circuits. Um, for example, I know the PCB is going to be here uh, on Sunday, and I know it only takes me one day to solder every, all the parts on the PCB. And I'll tell him, I'm sure Tuesday I'm going to deliver the product. <laughs> Don't do that. <clears throat> right, two, weeks, two weeks later, I'm still working on it. Why? Because I'm seeing all the arcs, the high voltages are arcing through all the circuits. You know, you, you cannot just directly use one piece of PCB to hold the low voltage stuff and also 3000 volts. Uh, it's going to arc, arc to everywhere crazily. I have to use separate PCBs or make a gap a lot bigger. So don't be too optimistic when you are um, trying to tell your customer on something. Have some reservation. Um, okay, any other questions? Nope. As the longest lecture I have ever given for this semester. <laughs>